Yes, 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 my beautiful family, come on in the room. It is time. I've been waiting for y'all all week long. I don't care that it's Labor Day weekend. We still going to give you this word. We still going to give you this heat. And I'm serious. Like, I've been waiting for y'all since Thursday. I know exactly how we're going to do this by the grace of God. And I need you to tag somebody. I need you to let them know, hey, you need to check out this message. Send out the invitation. And as usual, I love you all so much. Thank you for all of your subscriptions, all the shares, all your giving, all the love. It is just an honor to serve you. But tonight's message is coming for your perspective life. I think that we have a now word, especially dealing with what we have been dealing with in 2020. So take your screenshot, tag us, let us know where you are in the world and how this world, how this message, this world war message is blessing your life. And I want to get to work. We're going to start at Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. I think this is going to be so good. It might be new to some of us, um, depending on our biblical background, or it might be a story that we have heard before. We're ending, we're coming to the end of Joseph's, like, his training process. And this is where we're going to kind of park at for the time that we have together. Genesis chapter 50, we're going to launch our reading at verse 15. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brother's of the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Our clause of concern and where we're going to perform some surgery on tonight takes residence and lives in verse 20 of our foundational text. You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. God, would you allow this word to touch our hearts? Allow this word to perform surgery so that we can release those that we've been having bitterness against. Forgive those that have harmed us and let us have a kingdom perspective to forgive those and to release it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can I get everybody to drop the comment in the room? Amen. You intended it for evil. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for to accomplish what is now happening, the saving of many lives. This tree preached to me. I'm in my backyard, and I see this tree a few feet away from me, and its leaves are already changing colors. Now, just like to the artist, you can find art in anything. Just like to the producer, you can be inspired by anything. For the preacher, everything preaches. And I believe if this tree could have a sermon title, the title of this tree would be Change in 90 Degrees. <laughs> Change in 90 Degrees. I'm looking at this tree. And this tree is already changing colors. Its leaves are already changing colors, and it is 90 plus degrees outside in Houston, Texas. But this tree is preaching to me because it's showing me I don't wait until I see the change to change. I don't wait until the atmosphere lines up. I'm changing right now because I already know what's coming. And I feel as though that's a word for somebody God is telling you right now, prepare. Prepare in your finances for what's coming. Prepare in your health prepare in your mindset prepare in your relationships I don't have to wait until the breeze starts to change I'm going to change in 90 degrees 
<laughs> I'm going to change anyway. And then as I was looking at the Weather Channel, they were doing a poll of everybody's favorite season. And the favorite season, season the number one season that everybody selected was fall. It's not summer because it's too hot, depending on where you are in the world. It's not spring because there's too much pollen and it agitates my allergies. And it's not winter because it's too cold and there's too much snow and I don't want to have to wake up early and shovel. The number one season that the majority of people chose was fall. But here's the thing about fall. Fall is the way of the trees saying, look how beautiful it is to let things go. What makes fall so beautiful is it's a season of letting things go. It's a season of releasing. It's a season of I used to hold you in this season, but you're no longer conducive for this next season. And I'm going to allow to I'm going to allow for certain things to fall away. <laughs> I would like to speak from this thought around this subject for the time that we have together on tonight. I needed that. I needed that. I know this is kind of countercultural preaching, but can I get you to just go ahead and drop the comment in the room? I needed that. I, I needed that. I need you to say it with like I'm over it type of swag. I, I needed that. I needed that. I need you to put all caps in the room because you're too blessed to be stressed. I needed that. I needed that. This is a perspective message on tonight. I'm trying to articulate and trying to get somebody to understand. Stop being mad at certain people. Stop being mad at your father stop being mad at your mother yes yeah, stop being mad at your ex-husband or your ex-wife or your ex-boo or your ex-bae in other words let me say it how I want to say it stop being mad at what helped you develop there it is stop being mad at what helped you develop stop being mad at what caused for you to have a prayer life Stop being mad at what thrust you into the king's presence. Stop being mad at the very thing that God used to cause you to rekindle your relationship with him. Some of us need to stop being mad at our Judas because our Judas was essential in us fulfilling our assignment. Stop being mad at that. Stop being mad at what helped you develop. I think we need to get some stamps. We need to pull out our smartphones or our tablets, and we need to start texting some people. We need to send out some thank you letters and some thank you cards. Thank you. I needed that. It was the hell that you put me through that caused me to step into grace that God called me to. Yeah, just a random text. Thank you. I needed that because you showed me the value of standards. I used to think I wanted company. Now I just want peace. Now I just want clarity because all it takes is for one bad relationship to expose to you how valuable peace really is. Thank you. I needed that. Thank you. You only showed me what I would never tolerate again. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get somebody to drop the comment in the room? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Church family, please allow me and grace me with the platform that I'm given on tonight to interrupt your regularly scheduled Labor Day weekend with this important announcement and this breaking news. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. Did you hear what I just said? Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. I'm going to say it one more time for the marriage that feels as though it's hopeless and it's over and you don't know if God can resurrect this. I want to encourage you. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. I'll say it again for the single mother who's doing the very best she can as she's fighting to keep her sanity because you're trying to raise two or three children on your own in the midst of a global pandemic without any support from your family and the father of your children aren't helping you at all. I came to encourage you. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. For the college student that's trying to remain pure and you had all of these expectations for your graduation season because you're graduating fall 2020 and you had all of these things that you wanted to do, but now you got to do your whole season virtually. I came to encourage you. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. For the person that's facing a health challenge and you don't want to see another doctor, you don't want to talk to another nurse. You don't want another IV in you. You don't want to spend another night in a hospital bed, but you want to sleep in the comfort and the warmth of your own home and your own bed. I came to encourage you on tonight. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. 
for the couple that you're facing financial crisis and it seems as though every single time you have one step forward, something hits you and your financial gut that makes you take two steps back. And you just want some financial neck room. But here comes COVID. Here comes the coronavirus. Here comes the pandemic. I came to encourage you. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. For the individual, you've been faithful. You've been seeking God's face, but it seems as though the desires of your heart are going unheard, delayed, postponed, or God is just not responding to you. And you're confused because suffering is confusing to the individual who keeps their eye on heaven. You're serving, you're giving, you're fasting, you're devoted, you're seeking God's face, but it seems as though your prayers keep getting sent in the inbox of everybody else around you. Because he got the promotion and she got engaged and they're pregnant with their second child and they got the raise and they got approved for the house. And some of these people don't even love you, Lord. Some of these people don't even seek your face. But when I look at their life, it seems as though their life is filled with sunshine. They have blue skies nonstop. But my life. My life is filled with thunderstorm after thunderstorm, lightning flash after lightning flash. And God, I wonder where is the fairness in all of this? And if this is your perspective, I want you to change your perspective. Because if your life was filled with sunshine, you would be a desert. A dry, unproductive place. I came here on tonight to encourage you. Every storm cloud eventually runs out of rain. And once the storm passes, once the clouds roll away, once the turbulence ceases and you finally land on the runway of your answer prayer, when you finally land on the runway of next level, when you finally land on the runway of abundance, when you finally pull up in the terminal of God's will for your life, you will unearth and discover that you had to go through that so that you can get to this. Let me switch this to third person narration, if you will. If I never go through this, I'll never get to that. And if I want to get to that, this means I have to go through this. Because if I don't go through this, I'll never be able to get to that. And while I'm here, God is trying to deal with some wounds that happened there because I can't take what happened there over into there. So God has to deal with me while I'm right here because a lot of us, we think we're healed when our cut is now a scab. Negative. Truth is, when you see the people who cut you and you don't want to cut them back. All right. Y'all don't want to talk to me. <laughs> Truth is, you don't feel that tightness in your chest when you see those Facebook memories of five, six years ago and you see certain individuals that you don't mess with anymore. You see certain relationships that y'all aren't cool anymore and you feel nothing anymore of animosity or pain. That's when you're healed. Can I get somebody to drop the comment in the room? I needed that. I needed that. I needed that. Listen, God never told us. He never told us that you won't go through a storm. God never told us that you won't go through trials and difficult places. We have to speak about this because there's so many people who are questioning the faith, want to reevaluate their commitment and step out of the faith because they're going through a difficult season. God never told you that you wouldn't be thrown in a lion's den. Yes, we hear so much preaching about he's the God that will bring you out. What about he's also the God that will let you go in? He never promised that you won't be thrown in a lion's den. It's just that God knows how to shut the mouth of the lion. So all they could do is look, they could stare, they could growl, but baby, they can't bite. They can't bite. That's all some people could do. They could growl with their gossip. They could growl with their, with their critiques. They could growl with the things they could say, but they can't bite. In fact, some people probably wish they could take a bite out of you because that's the only taste of success they'll ever have is if they take a bite out of you. Preach Holy Spirit. God never told us that we won't be going through a hot places. God never told us that we won't go through a fiery furnace. It's just that God knows that you in the fire, you're going to come out on fire. 
Who am I preaching to on tonight? There's just a different level of preach you get once you've been in the fire. There's a different level of focus you get once you've been in the fire. Your prayer life is different once you've been in the fire. Your worship is different once you've been in the fire. Your praise is different once you've been in the fire. Your commitment is different once you've been in the fire. God knows you're going to come out of this without smelling like smoke. But I did not say that you're immune from going through fiery places. He never said that we wouldn't go through trials and storms. He knows how to have the waves hit and how to have the winds roar and let the rains pour. Yes, we might get hit. Yes, we might get wet. But baby, we ain't going to sink. We're not going to sink. Why? Because I'm with you in the midst of the pandemic. I'm with you in the midst of the process. And I always wondered, two things I always wondered. Why in the world would Jesus tell the disciples, let us go to the other side? And as they go to a other, as they are going to the other side, they encounter a storm of hurricane proportions. And the first thing that was confusing to me that we unpacked before is Jesus. How could you sleep through all this? I love to sleep through rain. I don't know if anybody else this is your story. I love to sleep through rain. I have an iPad that plays rain music for me when I sleep. I love to sleep through thunderstorms. But Jesus, you're sleeping through like a hurricane in the middle. <laughs> in the middle of this storm in a boat and the Bible says the waves were hitting the boat so hard that it was threatening to break up and Jesus down there knocked out how <laughs> how until I recognize what he's showing us that he's showing us this is what peace that surpasses your understanding looks like this is what you need to do when you're going through a storm rest in me when it doesn't seem like you can control it when it's nothing you could do I'm modeling to you what peace that surpasses your understanding looks like there may be chaos all around you but I'm gonna give you a level of peace where you'll be tripping over the fact that you're not tripping <laughs> the second thing I finally understood a study for this particular message. Why did Jesus tell them, ye of little faith? Ye of little faith. I'm thinking like, Lord, this is a storm. We didn't ask for this. What do you mean, ye of little faith? In essence, Jesus was saying, you can handle it. <laughs> I gave you the power to handle this. Why are you waking me up? I gave you the power to parent these children. I gave you the power to manage your budget. I gave you the power to get in shape. Why are you coming to me? I gave you the power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. I have given you that power. And he's saying, ye of little faith, because you don't recognize the power that you have. I'm going to give you another scenario. You remember when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt and as they're walking forward, I believe they start smelling salt like, okay, what's going on? And they see this Red Sea before them. And then they hear these horses coming behind them. And then now Pharaoh's army is coming before them. And now they're scared. I want you guys to see this. I want you guys to see this. Exodus chapter 14. Look at this. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. It says, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, bruh, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, bro? Saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. What in the whole world is going on? Y'all were in bondage. Y'all were being asked to make bricks without straw. You are praying to God for a deliverer. But now when you see a Red Sea, and now when you see an army, an army behind you, you start being, having amnesia. I, we didn't ask for this. <laughs> we didn't ask for this. It's like unto that woman who's saying, God, listen, I love you. I honor you and I adore you. But if this man is not your will for my life, please expose, re reveal, and remove. Let me know. Then you find out they're cheating. You find out that they live in some type of way. And then you're acting so hurt like, God, why, why did this have to happen? You ask for God to show you. You said, God, listen, they offer me this position, and I just want to be in your will. If this isn't your will, God, don't let me get the position. You don't get the position, now you mad. 
<laughs> you ask God for this. You say, God, I want a man that's after your heart. This man is not after God's heart. God answers your prayers and you're mad at him. <laughs> you mad. Isn't it crazy that all it takes is for discomfort and for us to be in an unpredictable situation, for us to go back to the very chains that we ask God to deliver us from? For some of us, all it takes is for bondage to apologize, for us to go right back into the very thing that was making your hair fall out, go right to back to the very thing that was causing for you to have wrinkles under your eyes, go right back to the very thing that was causing for you to experience trauma. We go right back. We're going through. And look at Moses' response. Moses, verse 13, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So let me put this how I think this really happened. Okay, so Moses sees Pharaoh and his army. He sees the Red Sea before him, and he hears everybody crying like, man, why you bring us out here? Bro, you stood us up. You foul, Moses. You foul, Moses. See, I told y'all he was suspect. And Moses like, hey, y'all, listen. God's going to deliver us. He's going to come through clutch, and we're going to be safe. Watch the salvation of the Lord. God, what we going to do? <laughs> what we going to do? We got all these people. You told me. You told me to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. You didn't say nothing about no Red Sea. You didn't say nothing about Moses. You didn't say nothing about Pharaoh and them coming behind me. What we supposed to do? See, some of y'all don't recognize that leaders, we really go through that. We really up here preaching. God is faithful in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of COVID. He's faithful. He's a faithful God. He's an honest God. Serve him and worship him. God, this is messed up. What are we going to do? We got people going through a pandemic. We got people getting laid off. We got people losing their jobs. We got people losing their loved ones. And I'm up here standing every single week before all these people trying to inspire them and tell them that you're a good God, that you're an awesome God. Moses, have no fear. <laughs> the Lord will fight for you today. God, what are you going to do? I need you to do something, bruh. <laughs> and the reason I feel as though this conversation went like this is because if you read verse 15, look at what God says to Moses. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? What? <laughs> I'm thinking like, he's like, okay, God, he's going to save us. We just got to have faith. God, what are we going to do? Why are you crying to me? Why, why, why are you crying to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. What if I were to tell you that the answer is in your hand? It's in your possession that God has given us everything we need right now to have peace of mind. It's at your disposal. And a lot of us are looking for miracles where God says you just need some mechanics. Why are you waking me up? Oh, ye a little faith. I gave you the power to overcome this. I gave you the power to raise these children. I gave you the power to be a husband. I gave you the power to be a wife. I gave you the power to be a pastor. I gave you the power to be a worshiper. I gave you the power to be a praiser. I gave you the power to be an evangelist. I gave you a power to be an intercessor I gave you the power and you're coming to me look at what's in your hand look at what's in your hand God is trying to tell us listen the things that you need is in your possession can I get somebody to drop the comment one more time I needed that I needed that I firmly feel as though my assignment on tonight is to the best of my capability to provide clarity to provide clarity and to switch the perspective of anybody who's ever vocalized one of these statements lately. Why is this happening? Why did this happen happen to me? I can't wait until will we ever get there. I feel as though if you ever vocalize one of those statements, why is this happening? Why am I here? I can't wait until... Will we ever get there? Hmm. Here, there, now, next. Here, there, now, next. Next, there, now, here. It seems as though these words are intertwined with one another. Here, there, now, next. Here, there, now, next. A lot of us want to get there. 
but we won't stop complaining while we're here. A lot of us want God to take us there, but we're still overly sensitive here. We still have a lot of rage here. And if you try to take that sensitivity there, if you try to take that pride there, if you try to take that bitterness there, if you try to take that lust there, if you try to take that sensitivity there, yes, your gift may check you in, but your character will check you out. God is trying to deal with us right here because unmanaged emotions causes delays. Unmanaged emotions causes delays. And God is like, I'm trying to deal with you here. I know that you keep talking about God. When will we ever get there? But there's some things I want to do right here. See, there's a lot of Jacob right here. But for there, I need you to be Israel. So let me deal with your Jacob while you're here. Yeah, there's a whole lot of Simon in you while you're here. There, I need you to be Peter. But if you can let me address your Simon while you're here. There's a lot of Abram in you while you're here. But I know there, you're going to be Abraham. But if I could deal with your Abraham, Abram nature right here, then I can prepare you and take you there. Everybody wants wings, but nobody wants to be cocooned. <laughs> Everybody wants promotion, but nobody wants to be processed. Can you corroborate your claim biblically? Yes, I can. I'm glad you asked. If I could call to the witness stand the first generation of Israelites out of Egypt, if I could call them to the witness stand, I believe they would come up here and join me at the stage and they would say, he's preaching good because God shifted us. God took us out of Egypt, but he didn't just place us in a promise. Whenever God takes you out, it is not always for the purpose to immediately take you in. Whenever God takes you out, he then places you in a season of detox he then places you in a season of rewiring and since we didn't allow God to rewire us while we're here since we didn't allow God to detox us while we're here since we didn't allow God to prune us while we're here since we didn't allow God to purge us while we're here we disqualified ourselves from ever getting there and was what was supposed to just take a week and a few days ended up taking 40 years. So now, now we had to forfeit our boarding pass to the next generation because we never allowed God to deal with what was going on in here. And I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, stop complaining while you're here. Stop running out of process while you're here because God is trying to mold you for the next level. He is. I know it's uncomfortable. He's trying to construct you for the next level. He's trying to read things out of you for the next level. Don't be like us. Don't be like us. The first generation of Israelites out of Egypt. Don't be like us or you will be like us. Never experiencing the promise that God has for us to walk into because God is a leader and not a dragger. Here's one of the massive differences between God and the enemy. The enemy comes in wherever there's an open door. God comes in when he's invited. <laughs> the enemy will just barge in. God stands and knocks at the door of your heart. And whatever level you settle for is the level God will let you live on. Joseph had a lot of questionable things happen in his life. He's thrown into a pit but he didn't allow that pit to become his label. Please hear me. He's thrown into a pit, but he did not allow that pit to become his label. He didn't allow his situation to become his label. Can I get you to drop this comment in the room? Never allow your situation to be your label. Never allow your situation to be your label. Because he was in the pit, but he didn't become pitiful. He was in the pit, but he didn't start throwing pity parties. Never allow your situation to become your labels. Yes, you might be thrown in the pit, but I don't have to become pitiful. Yes, I might face trouble, but I don't have to be troubled. Yes, I might be facing hard things, but I don't have to allow my heart to get hardened. Yes, I might be facing things that cause trauma, but I don't have to be traumatized. Yes, they may not have been faithful to me and they left me and turn away, but I don't have to turn my heart off. Never allow your situation to become your label. 
Joseph was also thrown in prison. And while he's in prison, I believe he still remembered his dream. In fact, while he was in prison, his gift matured. In Genesis 37, we see Joseph having dreams. But in Genesis 40, we see Joseph interpreting dreams. Did y'all hear what I just said? In Genesis 37, Joseph is having dreams. In Genesis 40, Joseph is interpreting dreams. The maturity of his gift happened while he is in prison. This lets me know any single time you're in a season that feels like punishment where it's actually development. This is so good, y'all. I wish somebody would have told me this. Listen, just because it's happening right now, does not mean God is not developing you. There's this chart I want you guys to see because I believe this is how it operates. I believe there's something in our life that happens. First, we have discovery. Then after we have discovery, we have development. And then after development is implement. And after implement is regiment. All of these next few messages are intentional. Tonight we're dealing with, I needed that. Then on Thursday, we're going to deal with confronting loneliness. And then sun, next Sunday, we're going to deal with, God, help me discover my calling. All of this stuff is, in, all of this stuff is on purpose because I won't, ab- I won't be able to discover my calling if I don't address my loneliness. Because the cure for loneliness is my calling. And if I don't understand that I needed that, then I won't be able to have the right perspective when I get to the next level. So God is trying to show us, he's like, listen, this is the place where you discover your gift. And believe it or not, y'all, some people live their whole life and never discover the reason of their birth. Their whole life. Once you discover it, then God puts you in a season of development. That's the hardest season. You got to think if you sign up for the military, the next thing you're going to do is go through boot camp. That's hard. You're going to have to endure stuff that you haven't endured. If you sign up for the Marines, you're going to be on Paris Island. You're going to have to be running five miles. They're going to change your diet. They're going to change the way you sleep. They're going to change everything about you because this is what development feels like. I understand and discover that you want to be a soldier, but I have to develop you into a soldier. And the reason I'm causing for you to develop into a soldier is so that if you're ever in warfare, you can implement the training that happened in your development. And now you have a lifestyle that carries out this regiment this is so good when I discovered my calling when I really discovered okay God is going to have me be a kingdom voice I just would select people in my life I wouldn't care I wouldn't consider their background I would just say, yeah come on everybody needs Jesus come on everybody everybody needs Jesus but in the midst of this discovery I discovered that some people really when they have abandonment issues they act like you're theirs y'all ever have friends like that this is my friend this is, this is my brother. This is my, there's this ownership. And when people view you as their property, they'll begin to try to sabotage other relationships around you that try to get close to you because they feel as though me being close to him gives him significance. I didn't understand this back then. But now since I had some development, since I've had some betrayal, I could stand before you and say, it was good that I suffered. It was good that I was betrayed because now Jerry has discernment. <laughs> now Jerry has learned some things. You got to be able to discern your Judas from your Peter. You got to be able to discern your Judas from your John. Because one is the beloved, the other one is a betrayer. When you can't discern the two, you'll be sharing your secrets to your betrayer versus your secrets to the one who loves you. And so now I learned some wisdom. And now I can implement that and I have a regiment. I'm going to make sure that everybody has significance outside of me. Make sure that you know your purpose. I don't give you no significance. I don't give you no value. But I wouldn't have learned that if I wouldn't have experienced betrayal. Discover, develop, implement, regiment. God teaches us in this process of discovery how to pray. Can I mess y'all up for a second? A lot of us have angels at your disposal that you never have used. <laughs> You never have used. You know why? Because you don't pray. You do know that one of the jobs of angels is to carry out the word of God that we speak. Y'all don't believe me, so I got some ammo to back this up. I'm glad you don't believe me. I'm going to show you this, okay? Psalms chapter 103, verse 20. It says, bless the Lord, you, his angels, who excel in strength and do 
his word. Certain translations say who carry out his word. Heeding the voice of his word. What does this mean? I want you to know that one of the job of angels is to carry out God's word. Which is why God lets us know he watches over his word to perform it. So when I speak words, when I speak words that are in alliance with God's word, it causes for angels to get that word and make sure that that word comes into fruition. A lot of us, we have to get our angels out of the unemployment line, if you will, because we don't even pray. So there's no words that we speak that the angels can carry out. So if I pray, Lord, on today, let your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path and death must respect my purpose and no weapon formed against me shall prosper it is the job of those angels to take that word and go before me and you don't even know there could be a car accident that was going to happen that day there could be a stray bullet that was going to happen that day but because you spoke the word it was the job of the angels to grab that word to make sure that that bullet that was coming your way goes another direction that car accident that was going to happen you're complaining about this light being out but you have no idea your prayers created a hedge I'm trying to give somebody some perspective when Satan went before God God said have you considered my servant Job there is no one like him on the earth and Satan said does Job fear you for nothing for you have put a hedge of protection around him and all that he has how in the world did Satan know that Job had a hedge God didn't tell us nowhere in the Bible that he put a hedge around Job it must be because the enemy tried it and some of us I know that you can give God praise for what you know he protected you from but can you give God a praise for the things you don't even know about for the things that were supposed to take you out for the things that were supposed to take your peace there's a hedge because it is the job of angels to take that word and to go before you and to carry it out but watch it it's also the job of fallen angels ah yeah here we go demons are considered fallen angels it's also their job to take our words that are in alliance with their kingdom and make them come into fruition, which is why we get death and life is in the power. Y'all not talking to me. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And you telling me we can't get you to pray? I'm going to give you more Bible. Look at this, Daniel chapter 10. This is so good. Daniel chapter 10. It says, verse 9. It says, yet I heard the sound of his words, And while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees, on the palm of my hands. And he said to me, oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. Look at this. Look at this. Your words were heard and I have come because of your. What does that word say? Words. I have come Because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me for I have been left alone there with the king of Persia to exegete this very quickly. The king of Persia is the enemy. This is like a satanic force around this particular area because demons love regions. It's obvious they have some setup over here in Persia and whatever Daniel prayed caused for there to be a war in the heavenlies. And the angel is telling him, listen, bro, as soon as I heard your words, I was coming to you, but I was resisted with enemy contact for 21 days. This is why you got to keep praying. 
Some of us, we keep stopping, keep praying, keep praying. What if what you're praying for is causing a war? And the angel was letting him know, I was coming to you ever since you spoke your words. But it caused for a war in the heavenlies. And that's what withstood me. And your prayer was so powerful that I had to call for somebody in the heavens to back door. I had to call for the angel Michael to come help me. Because what you prayed was causing a level of power released in the atmosphere. And we can't get people to pray. I can't. We think that we're just talking to the air and nobody hears us. I'm trying to show you in the pipe in the Bible that your words have power. Now it makes sense to me when he says death and life is in the power of the tongue. Point number one, it's okay. I needed that. I need to have a vision. I need to have a vision. I need to have a dream. I believe what a dream. I believe what a vision is, is it's a reassurance that what I see in the eyes of my heart, I will eventually see in the eyes of my head. I don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us, but I think one of the things that kept Joseph while he was in prison was his dream. I believe dreams are a snapshot of your coming harvest if you faint not. And so what God will do is he will allow us to have a vision. He will allow us to have a dream and put it in our bosom so that when we hit hard places, when we hit difficult seasons, we won't walk away from the faith because I remember my dream. I remember what God placed on the inside of me. Here's the question, y'all. Do you have a dream? Have you allowed this pandemic and this crisis to become so severe in your life where you forgot your vision? Joseph was placed in a lot of questionable situations, but the text never tells us that he questioned God. And I just have to think maybe what kept him was his dream. I could just imagine being sold into slavery. And it's like, this doesn't look like my dream. Being lied on by Potiphar's wife, thrown in prison. This this doesn't look like my dream. And maybe it makes sense now why it tells us in Habakkuk 2. Write the vision down and make it plain. Though it tarry, wait on it, for it surely will not tarry. <laughs> I used to wonder, how, how in the world are you saying, though it tarry, wait on it, for it surely does not tarry? That sounds like a contradiction. Is it coming or is it not? Is it tarrying or is it not tarrying? <laughs> and so I understand that God's like, listen, it may be tarrying to you, but it's right on time to me. I also learned from Joseph's life, be careful who you tell your dreams to. See, his brothers didn't necessarily have a problem with his dream. His brothers had a problem with where they were in his dream. I don't mind that you just are a dreamer, but why does your dream put me beneath you? And you have to be careful about telling people your dreams and your vision because everybody can't handle your growth and everybody can't handle what God is going to do in your life. Somebody say, I need a vision. Point number two, you're not going to like this one. I need a Judas. Yeah. (laughs) I bet somebody, I looked at the, look at the screen. He he meant I need Jesus, right? No. I need a Judas. How do you work with people that you know are looking for an opportunity to hand you over? Out of all of the disciples, one of the most important disciples that Jesus could have chose was Judas. Judas was a poor disciple, but he was excellent at his purpose. Excellent at his purpose. And a lot of times we're trying to get rid of the people that God is putting in our life that is necessary for your purpose. Watch this. Anytime a Judas shows up in your life and anytime a Judas shows up in my life, it means something in me has to die. Y'all miss what I just said. The purpose of Judas was to get Jesus killed. The purpose of Judas was to get Jesus to the cross. So anytime there is a Judas in our life, it's because something in us has to get killed. Something in us has to get to the cross. Look how this works. If Jesus never would have chosen 
Judas, Judas never would have betrayed Jesus so that Jesus could get to the cross. And if Jesus never would have got to the cross, there would never be a such thing as salvation. And if there was never a such thing as salvation, there would never be a such thing as the good news. And if there was never a such thing as the good news, there would never be a such thing as the gospel. And if there was never a such thing as the gospel, there would never be a such thing as redemption. But all of that was reversed due to the presence of Judas. Your Judas is necessary for your character development and for your purpose. I know y'all don't like that. I know you're like, hey, I was good until you said that. Last one, it all makes sense. We need a Joseph heart. What you intended to do, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what it is accomplishing now, the saving of many lives. What if I were to tell you God is having you go through each phase of your life so that you can get a heart to serve the very people that sold you into slavery, a heart to pray for the very people that took the unfair advantage of you, a heart to where when you see them, you don't even feel hate for them. This is how I know Jerry's growing. The people who tried to hurt me, when I see them, I feel sorry for them. I begin to pray for them. I begin to ask God to bless them because that checks my heart. And I believe what God is trying to do. Stop resenting what you went through. Stop being mad at what helped you develop. Stop being mad at all the steps I'm placing in your life necessary to get you to this phase. Because there's a heart type that I'm gonna need for you to have at the next level. But if you don't go through this, you'll never get to that. And once you arrive to that, you'll be able to say, I wouldn't have been able to get to here if I didn't go through that there. So God, help us to have a kingdom perspective. Help us to understand that every step, every phase, even our mistakes are a part of the journey. Our Ishmael mistake does not disqualify us from our Isaac promise. Process us, process us, oh God. Help us to surrender and climb on top of the operation table and perform surgery on our life and help us have the right perspective. Help us have the right perspective. I needed that. I needed that. I needed that. I needed that. It was meant to harm me. But God is going to use it for good. For all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called by his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.